but what we would be doing would be to, and, and we could do it on a bipartisan basis, I believe, lower marginal tax rates to 25 and 10, if you do away with a bunch of the loopholes that are in the current tax code. What I think we have to do is start with a clean sheet of paper and not the idea of going through and while well, picking out things that are currently in the tax code and then eliminating those. I think you need to start with a clean sheet of paper, decide what is absolutely essential to maintain as far as loopholes, uh, and don't include anything else. And that way you would actually increase revenues. Uh, when you've got companies like General Electric the year before last that made $14.7 billion of income and didn't pay a dime of taxes, I mean, that it's not fair. It's not fair to anybody. So what I'm saying is, for the short term, yes, extend it so that we can at least have some certainty for a year. Give us time to do a comprehensive tax reform and get that done. Would you eliminate mm -hmm. tax credits for things like home mortgages? I, I think, I, again, I think everything you start with a clean sheet of paper. Now, whether I, I don't believe that you would, I think you would find that certainly on your primary residence up to a certain level that that uh, deduction is needed. Do you need it if you have your third, fourth home someplace? You know, that that's where I think the debate is on that. So what you're saying is that the what you would support is to extend the Bush tax cuts beyond the deadline that's right. what, coming up. Right. Which we've already passed in the House. I think right. one year extension. Right. Okay. Right. And then on the, the um, sequestration, uh, that was a deal that sort of the, the Republicans sort of forced in order to get the it was the president's support. proposal, yes. Right, but to get the Republican support for raising the, the debt. The, so, where now we're back. <laughs> well, back I voted. I voted thing. against it. So, okay. So, okay. what do we do about it? Well, so what's your proposal? We have, we have in the House done reconciliation, which addresses the sequestration, and to stop those cuts from going into place because this it's not the way to reduce spending, to take an ax basically to the budget. What you need to do is go through and review every program that's in there, whether they're, uh, they duplicate other programs to eliminate them. You've got some programs that there are 10, 20, 30 of them trying to do the same thing. Uh, and that's what we have to do long term and, and budget wise. And, and to actually look at uh, where the, the cuts are sustainable and where the uh, uh, you know, spending that's not necessary today. Uh, what, in fact, is going to happen is it will cost somewhere around a million jobs if, in fact, uh, the sequestration happens on January 2nd. Whether and a lot of people talk about defense and what that will do to, uh, uh, to our military and their readiness, uh, but there's dramatic cuts as far as NIH funding, uh, education funding, all of the different areas that people really haven't thought about in this. And it's been amazing to me how quiet people who are going to be dramatically affected have been, whether they don't believe it will ever happen. But in fact, unless we have a bipartisan effort in uh, the lame duck session, uh, it's going to be real and it's going to be absolutely horribly expensive long term because you're going to basically void all the contracts in the Department of Defense. You're going to stop a lot of research at NIH and CDC, all of those things, and then to renegotiate all those contracts again afterwards uh, will be very, very expensive. So we've got to get that done. But the House has actually acted on that. So <clears throat> what accept cuts in defense? Well, there's already over 10 years, $437 billion of cuts in the Defense Department. Uh, are there, can we look at more efficiencies? Absolutely, in the Defense Department. Are there, is there waste? Absolutely, there is. And, and I have a, a, a bill uh, that would apply uh, lean Six Sigma methods that are used, and actually the Navy uses it now. Some of the different uh, departments are starting to use it. 
that would actually go towards reduction of the, the waste that's in departments like that. I, if my bill says it, we do it government wide. Uh, the projections are that it would save us administratively about 25% of the cost of delivering services and do a better job of it uh, by using practices that have are known to work in the private sector and in government. So there are some people who, who want to pull back those future cuts in defense. Mm -hmm. No, the, the the 437 billion that's already in place going forward. No, absolutely. I mean, the, the biggest threat, and Admiral Mullins, you know, the former chairman of the Joint Chiefs, the biggest threat to our national security is our national debt. Well, back back to that cut. I want to ask a, a question about. The, the Des Moines fire mm -hmm. that that is one way as I understand that the Pentagon is saying they need to, to make these efficiencies within within the national air national guard right. you're one of the, the members of the delegation that's opposing that mm -hmm. but how is the Pentagon going to get there if members of Congress protect all of their own pieces? well I, I would say they should have more air wings like the 132nd, it's about 35 cents on the dollar to have the same capability here as it is in the regular Air Force. And we have pilots with five times more experience, we have maintenance people with five times more experience uh, right here, and to lose that capability would be very, very expensive, it would not it would be irreversible. And that's what they talk about, is that uh, reductions should not be uh, irreversible. This would be. We would lose all that expertise uh, that we have here. These people are veterans. They understand uh, what it is to have to go to war. And they, you know, our pilots here, on average, about uh, uh, you know, what, five, six, seven years. Uh, maintenance people, ten to eleven years. Uh, in the regular military, it's not anywhere close See, to that. They made a mistake in their calculations. I, I think it's, yeah, I, as far as having the capability and, and holding down costs, this is the greatest bargain that they could ever hope for. Here. Well, I think a part of the argument is also, if I'm correct, historically when you look at before and after wars, the active military right. presence goes like this and right. brings it down, and now we're at one of the highest levels of active right. that we've been in decades. Right. Right. And typically the countries relied on the National Guard to stay here right. and then that, be ready. That should be the reason. So we're kind of we're going opposite in this yeah. whole yeah. debate, isn't it? Right. So, yeah. right. No, absolutely. I, yeah, the sequestration goes into effect. Uh, it's going to be very destructive to the Defense Department. You'll be back as far as an Air Force would be back to the start of the Air Force itself, uh, as 1947 when that became the Air Force. Uh, you would have an Army uh, that would be the size uh, of what the Army was before the Second World War in 1940. Uh, you would have a Navy that would be the size before World War One. I. I mean, and it's the, we have a very dangerous world out there. We need to have spending reductions. We need, but we need to maintain capabilities. Let's, let's Which talk. Your point is exactly <clears throat> right. I mean, the, we have the capability that we have. It's not irreversible. Is in our national guard and reserve units out there. Yes. If we can go back a little bit and talk about the uh, the idea of extending the Bush tax cuts, basically mm -hmm. kind of giving us a one year extension. Mm -hmm. There are some who say that's very logical, and you know, being able to sit back with a clean sheet of paper and let's figure out what loopholes can we close, right. what can we do to try to increase revenue and do all these things. There are others who say we're just kicking the can down the road for another year, and there's no evidence at all that this very rancorous congressional house, both sides of the of the aisle, are ever going to be able to work together in the House or the Senate. Are you optimistic about that? Do you think that really can happen? I'm very hopeful that the day after the election, people will actually look at the serious 